Could you maybe just help me understand what you think gave the Prime Minister the confidence to say it was going to be a temporary issue? Are there particular factors at play that might be temporary? Well, I think when you look at commodity markets as a whole, when you see a spike like this, you know, history has suggested that those spikes, spikes do go away. All I'd say right now is that, you know, that's not something that we Ofgem would rely on simply because, you know, we have to plan for a whole range of scenarios. OK, thank you. Uh, Alex Stafford, please. Thank you very much. And before I start, it's good to see Emma Pinchbeck. I just want to declare that her and I used to work together many moons ago for WWF. So really looking at the how the Fort Bob group, how significant is the current gas crisis, especially compared to the shocks um, over the last 10 years? And when the Secretary of State made a statement to the House a couple of days ago, he almost said that uh, at this time of year, it's not uncommon for gas prices to go up and companies to get into difficulty. So how actually significant is the current situation? So look, I, I do think this is a different kind of change. Uh, the, the sector has faced shocks. And in fact, you know, we've talked about how we've managed through the COVID crisis, which had a big impact on, on the energy sector overall. But when you see that change, and I encourage you just to have a look at the change of the gas price, it really is something that, that we don't think we've seen before at this pace. And so in, in a sense, when we think about the impacts, one thing I want to emphasize is let's just start with customers. And unfortunately, when you see costs like this change, <coughs> Ultimately, that will feed through to bills. And something we Ofgem are concerned about is making sure that customers are looked after throughout the changes and the impact on the sector. But equally, it is true that there are many suppliers under huge pressure now because of that quite dramatic change in their cost base. And on the sort of suppliers you mentioned, how many suppliers are actually risk? And are they large ones, small ones? And once again, going back to what the Secretary of State said a couple of days ago, he said, at this time of year, every year, some companies go out of business. What so, is the scale different? So look, I, I mean, we, we have seen exit from this market before. We've had, you know, up to double digit numbers of companies exit the market over time. So it's not unusual for suppliers to, to go out of the market. I think what's different this time is that dramatic change in the costs that those suppliers are facing. So we've had around sort of, you know, we've had five roughly over the past few months. We've had a number more at the start of the year. Uh, we do expect more. We do expect more to, to face the not to be able to face the circumstances we're in, but it's genuinely hard to say more than that, partly because that means predicting what may happen to the gas price. So, so all I want to say here is, this is a significant impact on the sector, and it is something that we're working with government to manage, but we can't make predictions as to how that will play out. You must have made some sort of prediction. You said more are likely to go under. How many more and how many customers, we talk about customers, are likely to be affected? Do you, do you well, believe or guess them at all any... So look, I, we're planning for a range of scenarios and we, we do expect a large number of customers to be affected. You know, we've already seen you know, hundreds of thousands of customers affected. That may well go well above that, but, but without sort of betraying commercial conversations we're having right now, it's very hard for me to put a, a, a figure on it. Okay. And just one last thing, so you, said large, you said a large number of customers, more than hundreds of thousands, so I take that you mean millions. Uh, you may not be able to say that, well, but that's what I'm reading. Well, uh, look, I think yeah, there's certainly a large number of customers, okay. and as uh, I say, we wouldn't want to preempt any processes of, that of we're, we're in. And right of now. those cust of those companies, are they going to be the large players as well as the medium and small ones, or are the large players relatively safe? Would you say? Well, look, I mean, we are seeing at six times the change in the gas price, six times the change in the cost that this industry has faced. So, what I don't want to do is sit in front of this this committee and make a series of predictions that are, are, are really hard to make right now. All I'd say is that we as Ofgem, as a prudent regulator, are making sure we plan for all scenarios. And I want to emphasize, this is something that we have war gamed. This is something that we have thought about and we have planned for. So we have the systems and processes in place to deal with that. But it really wouldn't be responsible for me to say exactly what I think may happen right now. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Alan Brown, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. If I can just stick with Jonathan. Jonathan, you've said that it, it's normal that some companies um, go bust effectively every year, and the Secretary of State said that it's quite normal com companies go under once it comes time to pay their new obligations. Surely that's a failure of governance if companies are allowed to operate until it comes to paying their dues and the renewables obligation? Well, that's one marker. So one marker is when the, the bills for renewable obligations come out, and we have worked with government to try and reduce the length of time we wait to get those payments in, and that's something that, that there is a consultation out and a discussion around already. Um, however, that's not the only time that companies go out of the market, and they, they do exit at different times of the year depending on circumstances. 
And clearly, when you see such a big change in wholesale costs, then for some companies, this is well beyond what they've been able to prepare and manage for. And that's what we're seeing in the exits today. So the renewables obligation is significant, but the, but the main factor is the changing costs. Just switch tack, what, what's your assessment of the overall security of supply um, going into winter? Or through well, I, winter? Want to, I, I want to re-emphasise what the Secretary of State said. We have one of the most secure and resilient systems in the world. And we have a diversity of sources of gas and we have a resilient electricity system. Now, you know, I've been in this business for sort of 15, 20 years, so you can't rule anything out, but we have a very, very resilient system that customers can rely on. Uh, can I turn to Emma, please? Do you agree with that assessment? Or is there other measures that, that your members think the government needs to be taking just to, to confirm security of supply over the coming months? So on security of supply, you know, we're following the advice of the Secretary of State, having spoken to the rest of the system, which is that certainly right now during this crunch, we're confident of keeping the lights on. I think sensible systems plan for every eventuality, as Jonathan is saying. So I know that the system operator will be talking to government and planning for you know other scenarios. In the long term, I would also say that the government needs to crack on with you know increasing the size of the power sector and investing in technologies that will sit alongside our renewables fleet things like hydrogen carbon capture other forms of storage and that's for two reasons firstly it removes us from the volatility of the international gas market to have more of our own domestic sources of generation um, but also secondly it provides a much more secure system that we can then you know um, perhaps trade, trade in, into the European system, it gives us more options, it gives us more control. And also, you know, this is for another committee, but there are huge advantages to the UK in doing that. The, the government has done all of the right things in pursuing that strategy, but we argue we shouldn't overlook the power sector as we move on to looking at things like heat and transport to carbonisation. So in short, the short term, very short term picture, I agree with Jonathan, it looks fine. We have to follow the Secretary of State's advice on that. In the medium term, we need to keep an eye on security of supply right through this very challenging period. And lastly, in the long run, we need to really crack on with delivering the system change we're talking about for net zero. Is there any issues that you've flagged up to the government or off chem that perhaps hasn't been acted on quite well enough concerns about the retail energy market or the, the, the yes. wider issues? I think actually, you know, building on security of supply the question of resilience is that we often default to thinking about infrastructure, but I would argue that what this crisis has exposed is that our retail sector is where we have real vulnerability in the UK. And whilst I don't disagree with Jonathan that any regulatory framework would be challenged by the increase in gas prices, and we are in the middle of an unprecedented event, there are features in our market design that make it very, very difficult for the retailers to adapt to the current situation. These features are things that we have raised with government on a number of occasions and with the regulator. Um, and, you know, long story short, it means that we're not just in a situation where we have regular market failure, where companies that, you know, in the traditional market win or lose. We've got companies that are very well run, that are well hedged, um, who are worried. And the retail sector overall makes a negative margin, which at a time of a price shock means that they've got nowhere to go. And that's worrying on two fronts. Firstly, the level of failure that we may see, and I don't want to stoke speculation or worries or create market jitters, but that is a factor, you know, as Jonathan said, multiple failures at once rather than spread over a period of time and the costs of that. But secondly, the real worry is that the, the sector is so fragile as a whole that players that might be expected to pick up customers are worried about doing so because of the costs of doing it. You know, there's no cash down the back of the sofa anywhere for the retailers at the moment. Um, and that's terrible well, we'll news. We'll come, come back to that. Can I just say quickly, because we're going to have to move on. Um, nobody, wants to put, nobody seems to want to put the figures in the public domain and how many customers might be affected. But are you talking behind the scenes about how many customers might be affected and what the backup plan is for that? We are, and I'm just going to echo Jonathan here, because we're worried about customers, I don't think it's right to speculate about the scale of the crisis, at least in, in a public forum. That's because, you know, we're already seeing record-breaking numbers of customers phoning uh, the consumer group helplines and their suppliers very, very worried about this period. And I would say that in the very short term, industry and government are doing the right thing. They're in the room trying to come up with solutions for the immediate crisis. My point is about 
the, long, the medium to long term, we cannot lose sight of the fact that our market design has contributed to the failures that may or may not come and the worries that we're experiencing right now. And it would be a shame if we missed the opportunity to have a root and branch review of our retail sector and ask some significant questions for how we ended up here. But no, I'm not going to speculate on the scale. Suffice to say, the undertone of what both Jonathan and I are saying is it's a serious situation. Okay, great. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Paul Howell, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, we heard you know, quite a bit of discussion about the, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline uh, in the press as to you know, both Nord Stream as it stands and also Nord Stream 2. I wonder if I could start with Emma and just uh, you know, what is the, you know, the, the impact level of this, both in terms of you know, how important it is to UK supply um, in, in the push through of, uh, of European supply and you know, the, the sensitivity of Nord Stream 2 for the, the longer term. We have an interconnected market with Europe, which I would say to you is a good thing in the long run. In fact, we, you know, not for this committee, but we would like to see continued and easy trading into the European markets and a, and a linked ETS, because that often makes it more cost effective for our customers. In the long run as well, when we have a large offshore wind fleet, it's going to make it easy for us to, to be an exporter of energy to Europe. But at the moment, obviously, we import a lot of gas from Europe. so. You know, what happens with Nord Stream and with um, the gas supply in general globally does affect us as, a, as an importer. There is a lot of conversation about the geopolitics of gas. I'm not going to touch upon that, but I'd say the picture for the spike in gas prices is more complex than just one asset. It's also about um, mild uh, summer reduced shortages of gas supply as a whole, and that's to do with things like the liquid natural gas market moving to Asia rather than Europe and, and other global factors. Um, and, and we're seeing this, you know, play out in other countries. We've also seen a change in demand, um, which doesn't then, uh, then again affects supply because we've had warmer and weirder weather patterns. Um, but also the pandemic has, has changed demand patterns too. So it's a mix of factors. It's not just Nord Stream. In the long run, also, you know, connection with our European neighbours is a good thing for customers because of, you know, the transition that we're going to be going through with our own infrastructure. Okay. <clears throat> Could I ask you, Jonathan, just to expand a little bit on that in, in terms of the significance? Yeah, I know you've, under, you've said that there are many factors, but if you yeah. were going to re <clears throat> rate the factors you've just listed there, you know, if there's five factors, is the Nord Stream one out of five, five out of five, or are they all broadly similar in terms of impact? Well, I mean, if I were to, to abstract out of it all, I, I, there are two, two big factors, and one is the, the demand factors that Emma, Emma described, particularly coming out of Asia. To give you an example of scale, so two thirds of all the gas that the UK uses has been added to the amount that we thought we would need in the market. So when you look at what the IEA has said, there is definitely more demand that, than anyone expected. Um, but honestly, you know, and it's, it's not for me to comment on the behaviour of companies or countries, but if there are supply restrictions or if there are challenges around pipelines, those will have an enormous impact because a marginal shift in a market this tight Creates, creates the kind of price spikes that we're seeing. Okay. Um, could I just ask you know, whether Ofgem is engaged with um, EU and Norwegian regulators to ensure that there's any increased friction in energy trading because of the UK's withdrawal from the internal energy market has is, uh, is not been overly disadvantaged? So I, d I don't think that's been a factor in, in the current set of, of, of problems. Look, we, you know, we, we have good access to gas, we have good trading. This is, a, this is a global problem, a European problem. We're not the only country who are facing issues. For example, Spain, you can see, have had similar issues. Japan has similar issues. And I do talk regularly to, to regulators sort of ac ac across Europe to discuss this. I'm also in touch, for example, with a German regulator to try and just understand the situation, particularly with supply there. So all I'd say is this is this is not a, a British problem. This is a, a global problem, and it's caused by a global gas price. Thanks, Jonathan. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Nitrate Garni, please. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to something that Jonathan just uh, regarding my, my colleague's questioning. I know you don't wish to um, speculate, but I'm just trying to understand how you're, you're forecasting, and in particular, touching back on Nord Stream Two. The European Commission is is has been urged to open up an investigation into the deliberate market manipulation by Gazprom. Did you have that in any of your forecasting and how our government should respond to that? So we, we do do forecasts of the overall gas price and we, we do look at, at the market projections at the time. But this is a discontinuity. It's far, far above any of our even most conservative projections would be because it, it's not just that, that issue, the issue of supply. It is the supply plus the demand factors. Plus there's some 
what sound like quite granular trading issues around simply the number of ships you can get on the water, the, all the issues that are around ports at the moment. So it is a continuation of events that have led to this, and it is beyond what any of us thought would happen at this time of year. Could I, if I could ask a supplementary chair, forgive me. So, Jonathan, would you agree with um, what other colleagues are saying here in the UK Parliament that this can be considered as a grey zone conflict, um, the manipulation of the supply chain? Do you think it is that serious or not? So, look, it, it, it's not for me to comment on, 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 on the, on the behaviours of other countries and companies outside the UK borders. My remit is, is within these. All I'd say is any restriction of supply will have a big impact on the market this time. Thank you. Mark Jenkinson, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question for Jonathan uh, initially. How well do you and Bayes understand the financial position uh, of energy retail businesses and the challenges that they face? So we have detailed financial analysis on, 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 on all retailers. We talk to all retailers and we have, particularly since the COVID crisis, made sure that we have clear understanding of the position of different companies. But, but, but what we've had to appreciate is the, the, the scale of change of that situation has been really fast in the past few weeks. And I just want to emphasize something that Emma said, you know, that there is a question about the behavior of some companies and the, and the risk management behind them. But all companies are feeling the strain in, in any market you would when you've seen input prices go six times above the, the, the way they were last year. Thanks. So when you say you have detailed financial information, what do you have an active role in the governance of, of any of these companies, attendance at any of their audit and risk committees or anything like that? So we don't attend audit and risk committees, but what we do, apologies, just one moment. Um, Lights have gone out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> don't panic, that's not a security of supply that's issue. Jonathan's <laughs> room. Unfortunately, while we talk about security of supply, no, I know, it's, it's movement sensitive lights to save energy efficiency, just to reassure the committee. The, um, the, so, so, so what we do have is something we call a request for information. So we, we ask a detailed financial analysis from suppliers, and that's what feeds into our overall assessment of the market. Now, as you can imagine, we have been upping the pace and scale of that as the, the gas price situation has emerged, um, and that's what we rely on. When, and, and then we discuss with individual companies where we have concerns. So why did this, sorry, I'll come to you in a second, Emma. Why did this take, take us by surprise then? D do we need to improve the quality of that monitoring? monitoring? Do we need to increase the um, frequency regularly rather than just wait for a, for a crisis? So look, I, I think we, we are going to have a lessons learned after this. And I just want to come back to some of Emma's comments. We're going to have to look at this in detail. But we have regular requests for information, which we do process. And we have a very, very detailed look across the market. The, the, the thing is, is the situation changed very, very quickly, particularly in the month of August. And that's what we've been responding to. Equally, when a company is struggling, when a company is financially facing financial difficulties, we don't just sit back and look at the financial information. We have very, very detailed conversations with them. Now, those do take some time ordinarily. You know, they do take time to work through. It's a tough decision for any company to accept that they are in a, a situation that's unrecoverable but we are a full part of those conversations. And my retail director, as you can imagine, has been working across the sector to make sure we understand the position of different companies and respond to it. Emma, did you want to come in? Please, look, I think your question is about, you know, how much of this is to do with badly run businesses. And it, frankly, it, it isn't. I'm sure there are some badly run businesses in the sector, um, but, and they would, in any normal market environment, fail against well-run competitors. but. On top of that, let's not forget that the businesses are heavily regulated. As Jonathan is saying, he has access to you know, a lot of commercial data. There's 500 pages of regulation that every company needs to, to meet to enter the market. The, the current crisis is, is, a, is affecting well-run companies as well as you know, any, any badly run companies that may be out there. It's, it's across the piece. And just to come back to that, I took this job a year ago when I was hired the chairman of Energy UK said, your biggest challenge is going to be the vulnerability of the retail market. And I know that for a year or more before that, my team have been making the case to the regulator and to government that the sector is fragile. And a lot of that is about market design. You know, uh, no competitive market would be making a, a, an average return of a minus 1%, which is according to the same figures Jonathan has told you he's looking at. So, you know, there's, 
there's a short-term crisis here, which is in some ways out of our control. It's to do with the gas price, but it's been exacerbated and arguably caused by our regulatory design. And that is a resilience and security of supply risk for the future. It's terrible news for customers in the long run. And when we are through this, whatever support we put in place in the short term to make sure that customers are looked after, we desperately, desperately, desperately need, need to stop dismissing retailers when they say the market design is not fit for purpose, the market design is harming customers, the market design means that we're not making any margin, and the market design leaves us vulnerable and fragile. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you. Jonathan, can I just come back to this for a second? Um, in the last year, for example, if you've seen you know, profit and loss for companies, how many of the, I think there's around 70 suppliers, how many on average have been loss making in the last year? So, so basically in the last year, we've seen a total of seven companies that have exited the market, um, starting right back in January, actually, where, where, where some of them exited then. Uh, we've had fluctuation in the numbers over the years. As I say, there was a, a point after the Beast of the East where we saw a large number of companies exit. So, Jonathan, I don't, I, I don't mean exit, yeah. I mean loss making. So companies that have been allowed to continue to offer services in the regulated market, but you know from their financial reports are not making any money. So there are a number. Of, there are a number of companies that are loss making. How many? Um, but so it, um, it, it, in a sense, I think the majority have been struggling. That has to be said. But many of those are, 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 are doing that for different reasons. So to give you an example, there are some companies who, although they are making a loss, part of that loss is driven by them investing in growth. So there are companies that are quite deliberately wanting to grow and are investing in making themselves bigger, and they've become quite successful. There's some very successful players who have a big growth strategy. Equally, we have seen some companies clearly in profit, particularly in the, in the, in the public market, um, but there's a change going on. And I want to bring the committee back to the, the discussion we've been having over the last sort of five or so years. And I want to remind the committee of what the CMA told us about the retail market. And it was two things, really. First of all, there has been customer detriment in the market previously when we didn't have such a thing as a price cap. Um, and we know that margins at that time were not things that I think are acceptable to customers. And equally, companies need to change their operations. They need to change the way they were run. Now, Emma is right. The average margin was minus 1%, but that was going up from when the price cap was introduced because companies have adapted and changed. Now, I think I accept that we will have to look at the resilience of the market, given the scale of the cost shock that we've seen this time. And we'll have to ask ourselves a question as to whether we need to prepare for things like this in the future. But I do want to come back to the point that ultimately companies do need to adapt and change and there are some very successful players in this market who are growing. Okay, Emma, if you want to come back quickly and then I need to move on. But... Uh, you know, it's probably an edifying to have a punch up with your regulator in public and, um, and, it, and actually, you know, in the short term, I think we're welcoming the engagement with government and the willingness to look at short term solutions in the sector. But just, just to reiterate, this is the whole sector that's struggling. So it cannot just be about badly run or, or well run companies. It has to be about market design. Jonathan has just said negative margins across the board. And the CMA review was a long time ago. And we absolutely agree, absolutely agree as a sector that there's been some really good things coming out of that. Built businesses that are incredibly successful, innovation, more efficiency, um, low costs for customers in the short term. But I, I think our point here is we need to do something in the short term to look after customers. That's clear because the, the market is so fragile, we can't respond. But in that the market is so fragile, we can't respond. There are big questions to answer about whether or not the market design that we came up with after the last CMA review mm. is still adequate for either the conditions of the wider energy sector or whether it's successfully managing short term and long term risks to customers. And Fundamentally, this is about customers. Any market failures will have to be picked up by customers So, uh, in the end. And so we're not disagreeing that there have been some really good things about what's happened in retail policy over the last decade. Why we haven't reviewed that retail policy, given what we have known to be true about the fragility of the sector, is the question. And I'm pushing it because if we get through this crisis and forget about that, then we failed to plan for the future and for security of supply. Thank you. Richard Fuller, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. If I may, I'd like to ask uh, some questions about aging uh, and forward planning by energy companies to uh, Emma Pinchbeck and also the observations from Adam Score, if I may. Um, Ms. Pinchbeck, on, on the hedging markets for energy, um, have they been working historically? Are they working now? 
Thank you for that. So I, I won't come on in every, you know, every company's hedging strategy is down to them. But I, I would say, you know, coming back to this point of the current crisis, it's very difficult to hedge for something this significant that I think, you know, as Jonathan said, we've had a 300% increase in gas prices since the beginning of the year. Um, so naturally, when you get a price shock, it's a shock for a reason, you know, it's very hard to predict. That said, a lot of our retail members in particular are telling us that the scenario plan, just like the regulator does, in any well-functioning market, they should be able to hedge for events like this. And the point of significant concern right now is that there are, there are features of our market design which makes it very difficult to them, for them to hedge as far ahead as they might like to. You know, for example, the um, methodology of the price cap, and this isn't a discussion about whether we should have a price cap or not, it's just illustrative of the methodology. The methodology of the price cap is neither flexible enough, moving you know rapidly enough, nor allowing enough he headroom and margin for, for sufficient hedging. And then when you get a price shock, that becomes. Can very I just can I just follow? Up? That's an important point. Uh, so if I can just ask Mr. Brearley, is that criticism that the price cap essentially limits access of UK companies to certain hedging products? Correct. Well, you can hedge. I, I think there's two things. So so first of all, in in any price cap you can't allow for, for any circumstances because you simply build up to a rate that is not sustainable for customers. And the methodology of the price cap is one that companies can hedge against. And we do have within the price cap what we call headroom, which is simply space for things that are unable to be managed in, in anyone's hedging strategy. But I think coming back to the point, when do you get to the point where, where costs have increased as much as they have? Clearly this puts companies under strain. But the point I would make is we do have a range of companies out there. Some are managing very well through this. Some are really, really struggling. So we just have to look, once, once we're through this, to look at how those two different behaviours have been managed. Ms. Pinchback, you must surely accept that, that in this we're seeing certain companies that have been prudent, have been able to uh, look forward, perhaps in a more comprehensive way, who've done what Ofgem themselves said they had done. Mr. Brearley said earlier on that Ofgem had war-gained this. From your observation of your members, is there a wide disparity on the skill sets of people and the uh, prudence of people in approaching the, the hedging markets? I, I think the first thing to note is, of, of course, we're not arguing for support for failing companies, but uh, again, the So you're prepared sector, to accept a number of companies will fail, and that's fine? In any normal market, we've had companies that fail. We've had failures, as Jonathan has said previously. The point right now is we think good, well-run companies will fail, and, and that is you know, a function of both the price shock but also market design and why we're talking to government and they recognize it as a crisis. I would say this is a highly regulated market. So that, that point about you know well-run companies is one for the regulator. They've had access to the same data we do. There's a 500 page supplier license that they're in charge of. If they've had concerns about companies, they, they could have been dealt with. Certainly, we have, as an industry, called for things like the supply license review to make sure that companies are financially well run. We've been worried about things like fit and proper persons and knowledge in the sector. Um, we have been worried about market distortions from, from the retail market, and we have made those points you know, in public to the regulator frequently. Um, the last point, though, is, is this. It's very important that we, in making choices about regulatory design, we do allow innovation, we do allow new market entrants, we do allow um, new companies. Uh, my question is about the hedging markets, Ms. Pinchbeck, not, and, not more and, broadly, if I may say. And so different companies have different hedging strategies, but I'm confident that this crisis is not not one of the industries making. This is This is something, this is a combination of the international price shock and then our regulatory market design. I wasn't sure if Mr. Brilly wanted to come in, but yeah, seconds. I just wanted to come in on, on, on one point. Uh, yeah, ultimately, companies need to make decisions on their commercial strategy. We have, we do regulate that, but ultimately, of course, people are going to take a different. Apologies, I've got the fire alarm. The, the different degrees of risk. off gym today. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, that that is part of what happens in any market. I'm just going to. Okay, uh, Mr. Scorer, you've been listening very uh, diligently. Uh, so with your approach of on behalf of con consumers, how do you think companies have, have managed in their forward planning? Do you give them an A grade, a B grade? Do you accept that it's a once-in-a-lifetime issue, or are you kind of furious? 
I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business of, of grading people on their on their hedging strategies. Oh, That's not the, the interest of us. <laughs> um, I, I mean, clearly, what we're saying, if market failure happens and a number of companies go to the wall because they're less prepared to, to cope with, with spikes, that has an issue for the structure of the market and it has an issue for the intensity of competition and the sorts of innovative programs that, that or offers that you come out. For consumers that I work with, low-income, vulnerable households, the cost of failure, if you're with, with one of these companies, is is pretty severe. Um, I expect, given all the media, uh, that my company will may well go under and I'll be part of the supplier of last resort program. That's fine for me. I'm concerned about those householders who will be trying to carry a debt repayment package with them, a warm home discount eligibility entitlement with them, a prepayment meter exposure with them, and to make sure that the, the more companies who are either fail because of their unhedged or they're insufficiently capitalized that go under, the larger the number of consumers get caught up, the larger the cohort of low income and vulnerable consumers get up, and the more that those companies who take over that uh, customer base are going to have to have a laser focus not just on me and my credit balance, but on the debt repayment, on the warm home discount entitlement, on the prepayment requirements of a lot of low income and vulnerable households. And I don't think that the current arrangements have been designed for that scale and those issues. They're an occasional mechanism to ensure that nobody is left without supply. And following Emma's point, if we come out of this, uh, this particular period of time and we don't learn the lessons about how market regulatory frameworks are focused on the least, on those consumers with the least agency and the least ability to intervene in markets for their own benefit, it would be a pass-fail criteria for me. So, Unfortunately, so, so, too little about hedging strategies to comment. Uh, sorry, can I just then draw you on to potential uh, uh, involvement by the government to support failing uh, energy retailers? So, the Financial Times listed three approaches: uh, a bad bank approach, uh, an approach where uh, government underwrites the debt of larger market incumbents for taking on loss-making customers or effectively where Ofgem steps in and administers com uh, company or companies that fail. Uh, do any of those, from, from your point of view, Mr. Score, seem like the right approach? Are there other alternatives that you think the government should be taking? Or do you not think the government should intervene at all? But what I appreciated from government, although there was a discordant tone from the Prime Minister yesterday, is that this is the, the, the imperative here is to protect consumers and low-income households from the impact of this price rise. I'm afraid I couldn't tell you which mechanism would be the best, but it's the uh, in order for the to maintain the largest number of suppliers or underwrite the costs of those suppliers who are left in the marketplace. But the principle must be that if the state intervenes and the government intervenes, it is to enable consumers and especially those on the lowest incomes to come out of this with the damage limited to the greatest extent that it would could be. So those are all realistic options. I'm afraid I do not have a preference. I would like to have seen some discussion about something else which affects both householders, customers and suppliers, which is how we can accelerate mm. the, uh, yeah. the the pay down of severe household energy debt, which cripples suppliers and it cripples householders at the latest estimate. But this was last year or the beginning of this year, citizens of ICE assuming, uh, saying that over two million households in debt. Uh, over 6 million households anxious about their ability to, to pay for their energy costs over this winter. You add these situations on it, the debt challenge for suppliers and for customers is going to be extreme. So some element of any bailout subsidy mechanism that accelerates the ability to pay down problem debt of householders would seem to me to address two challenges at the same time. Thank That's you. what I would mm -hmm. like to see in the package of measures that government comes out. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Score. Ms. Pinchback, Mr. Score has been clear on his objective, but um, open on which of the approaches should be taken. Do you agree with the priority that Mr. Scorer placed for government, any potential government invention, intervention? And do you have a preference between the options that I listed or any others for how the government could respond? So, um, a couple of things. Like, firstly, I think it would be good to come back to the hedging question at some point. But on this particular question of what we do in the current situation. Firstly, I think there has been a lot of sometimes unhelpful speculation in the press. And frankly, the um, solution to this problem is in the gift of the regulator and the government. So I, 
I um, won't necessarily speculate on the exact solution, but I would broadly agree with the priorities here. The priorities are to make sure that customers have secure supply, and that's the first, the first thing. Um, and secondly, to make sure that we do have a vibrant, sustainable retail sector where this problem won't continue to happen. And thirdly, obviously, to make sure we do this in a way that is as fair as possible for customers in terms of the cost. And again, that's one of the reasons we do need to look at retail policy. There is a cost failure. We have multiple failures. We ask questions about market design for our customers. In terms of um, just the process, just to, to give you some very quick background, there is an existing mechanism for picking up when suppliers fail. Jonathan and I have both referenced it. It was introduced in 2003, so and we've never been... If you could just, re, just sorry, just in interest of time, be very brief, because yeah. I do have a follow-up well, question my, for you. My and point is more that it was, designed, it was designed at a time for, you know, it wasn't designed with this kind of price shock um, envisaged, I think it's fair to say, or for okay. multiple failures. And the biggest problem, aside from the number of failures that may or may not happen at once, and the administrative challenges of that, um, and the number of customers involved is that the whole sector is fragile and it's difficult and expensive to onboard new customers. Um, we think there could be a cost sectors of aren't fragile. Are companies are fragile, and uh, or some companies the may be fragile. Sector is fragile. So you, 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 you said you earlier say, on. You said earlier on, if I may. You said earlier on that companies there was quote no cash down the sofa. What yeah. sort of responsible board of a company gets involved in supplying electricity to people who are indebted and who are at risk? on the basis of the fact that they have no cash down the sofa if things go wrong? I think you are trying to characterise this as an as a industry issue in terms of you know, the, the problem here being about companies being badly run across the piece. But I would ask you, if we're in a situation where every, you... every single supplier, small and large, in the market for 30, 40 years or new into the market, is making a negative return, that is a sector-wide failure. It's not the failures of individual companies. And, well, well, and I I'm think afraid, Ms. Pinchbeck, the there, is a, there is a corporate responsibility on boards to act in a absolutely. prudent way. Absolutely. If you, yeah, as the absolutely. person representing the industry, say that, quote unquote, there was no cash down the sofa for a large number of companies, that implies that the governance of those companies was falling short. Isn't that not a fair conclusion? I'm not saying it's all companies, but surely some companies. No, I think that's it's not a fair conclusion. So I think, you know, firstly, the regulation of the sector and the decision about whether companies are well run is in the gift of the regulator. There is a 500 page supplier license that these companies follow. I'm sure there are some badly run businesses in the sector. We usually see those fail, but generally speaking, we're talking about well run companies who are doing their best to be efficient. Okay. But despite all of those things in the current market design, not having enough money to weather the shocks. And this is about whether there is additional money on top of sensible hedging, sensible planning, sensible you know, scenario analysis to put into a situation like this one, and it just isn't available. And so in the short term, absolutely, we need to do what we can for customers, and, and there will be businesses there who will be able to pick customers up. We're, we're sure of that. There is, though, a longer-term question to come back to about how much of this is about individual companies and more about the regulatory framework that got us into the situation. Think, How is it possible that we've been I think you've made that point a number, number of times, Ms. Pinchbeck, and just in the interest of time, if I may, I just had a final question to Mr. Brearley. With this talk of different forms of government intervention, aren't we at risk of giving companies in the market who are working well and are effective a sort of one-sided bet that essentially they know the taxpayer is going to bail them out, rather than asking them to go back to their shareholders for investment to get through this period? Well, look, um, and I just want to come back to, to the discussion that you've been having. There is a range of different businesses in this sector, and there are a range of different businesses in different situations, and there are businesses that are well capitalized, and there are businesses that we do expect to weather the storm that we are seeing. Now, what is different, and Emma is right, is the scale of what we've seen and the scale of change of the underlying costs and the work we've been doing. So the discussions we've been having over the past few days really are about how we adapt off-gem systems and processes to make sure they can manage in a world that is a much faster set of exits than we'd normally manage for. Now, as part of that, one question that has been raised is around simply the financial capacity for companies to absorb potentially large numbers of customers. But, but the question you, you raise is exactly the right one. You know, we don't want to be having further intervention if we don't need to. And of course, you know, we have to, we have to balance this. We have to make sure that we are 
up to the scale of the challenge, we have to make sure that we have the conditions necessary for companies to, for customers to be transferred and the companies are able to do so. But this, the system that we used is a well-run process and it's one that we've run many, many times before. So all we are doing in the discussions we are having are saying if this changes and it could change very fast, we're ready and we have all the conditions that we need in place. Thank you. Can I just encourage witnesses to be direct in your answers to the questions you're asked, just because we're running behind quite a bit. Thank you. Mark Borsey, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can I just ask uh, Mr Brearley about his message to consumers and the message to consumers that he's previously given? Because when the energy price cap rose in August, the advice was to shop around for a better deal. But we know that there are these new entrants into the market, and frankly, the only device that they had got to attract new customers was to offer a better price. And there is a, a premise in business that if a deal appears to be good, too good to be true, it probably is. And in the light of what's now happened, many of the deals that were available were too good to be true because those businesses have failed and those consumers uh, are now faced with having to find a new supplier. Do, do you regret that advice at that time, Mr Brearley? Well, if you look back over the, over the last five years, the customers have absolutely benefited from switching and not just to get the lowest price. We've seen some companies bring incredible change into the sector and that is something that all of us absolutely want to see. Now, the problem is, is the change we have seen is unprecedented in scale and that really has put a lot of companies under strain. Mr. Brewer, right that, may, now, that may be the case, but it's, it's left many consumers concerned about what their future supply is and whether they're going to be moved over to another supplier, perhaps back to the supplier that they've only just left. Now, I accept that, and I accept that this, this is a, a worrying time for customers when they see their company exit the market. But remember, every customer in this market is protected by the price cap. The price cap is calculated to be a fair price for your energy and a price that, but, but no more than that. But we do maintain that overall, in a normal functioning market, the switching had delivered huge benefits for customers. So it's not something, it's something that we're adapting to now in the way the costs have changed. And we just have to make sure that we can see the market through this and then build a more sustainable market in the future. Yeah, and Mr Scorer, where do you see the priority for customers right now? Is it security of supply or getting a good price? Damage limitation is the, the uh, uh, priority for most customers at the moment, uh, I'm afraid. Um, I, I think there's the issue about the, the, the price cap. If we didn't have the price cap, I worry to imagine what the impact on households would be this winter and what the level of customer confidence in a market of any shape or any intensity uh, would be. But the price cap is a fair market intervention. It's not a fuel poverty intervention. It's to level up for those people who don't switch very often. Um, my charity's concern is with those people who uh, have less agency sometimes in the market or are structurally unable to take advantage of those best deals because they haven't got broadband, they haven't got the confidence of doing direct debit, they may be in debt, they may be on prepayment meters. So for us, it's, to be honest, less about the intensity and the innovation in competitive markets. It's more about the regulatory backstop and it's more about the support that we provide for customers who are disadvantaged in market and from whom the price cap, I don't think everyone's gonna appreciate it this winter, but is not a sufficient response to their ability to afford energy. And will you be advising um, people to, sh to shop around right now? I think our advice is to, if you're in debt, make sure that your your risk of going in debt, make sure you talk to your suppliers straight away, not out of the kindness of their heart, but because often the regulations require them to arrange debt repayment with you. We, we're advising people get all the benefits to which they're entitled to. Our charity sometimes increases people's incomes by multiple thousands of pounds and to see whether they're on the warm home discount, to do basic things like check their thermostat settings and their hot water settings. But to be honest, given that so many uh, price sensitive or price competitive offers have left the market, I'm not telling people to switch around. Unfortunately, what we're saying is for a lot of people, sit tight, see what happens to your customer, but make sure that when you do, if you do get switched uh, by the solar process to another supplier, that you're having really strong conversations with them about your needs and your your particular vulnerabilities. Great, thank you. Let's move on, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Alan Brown, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, if I go to Jonathan, please. So BBC's report on uh, industry sources suggests that there could be little as 10 companies left in the retail energy market by the end of, win uh, end of winter. Is that a scenario you factored in? I know you're not going to give an estimated companies, but is that, is that a, a possible scenario that you're having to look at? Uh, quite frankly, I think um, 
sources putting out numbers of companies at this time are not doing so on credible information. So the situation is highly changeable. Now we'll plan for a whole wide range of scenarios, but we, we sat with the small suppliers, the Secretary of State and I sat with the small suppliers you know, only a day ago. And, and the message from some of them was, look, can we stop talking about small numbers of, of people being left at the end of the, this? There are going to be companies that are resilient through this. Right now, the situation is changing. I don't think we should be putting a number on that scale of change, but of course we'll plan for any scenarios. But my strong view is that people saying that we're going to go down to a small number such as 10 simply aren't doing that on the basis of any credible evidence. Okay, so you don't think that's possible on the, the evidence you've looked at then? So you're confident that can't happen on the, the financial okay. information you've assessed? So what, what I'm saying is we are planning for a very wide range of scenarios. So, so, so in a sense, given the, the scale of change we're seeing, we're not putting boundaries on what's possible, but I don't think that we can put a number on it. And I don't think people can do that right now. Okay, well, whatever happens, you have said that some companies will exit the market and then we yes. need to get into the, the supplier of last resort process. There's obviously costs to companies picking up uh, new customers and these costs can get recovered through levies on the bills. So what kind of estimate are you making of what might be added to consumers' bills and what sort of time period are you going to allow for this to be recouped by other energy companies? Well, well, again, just, just, given, just given where we are right now, it's hard to put up an overall figure on that, but um, we do have a system to recover those costs, but that does take time. So those, those levies don't appear on bills immediately. They appear on bills after about 15 to 18 months or, or, or even slightly longer, depending on the calculation. And remember, those, those ultimate costs are, are also based on the future of the gas price. So we have to see what happens to the gas price to see the implications that there will be for customers over time. And clearly that's linked to the number of companies and the number of customers that go through the process. I'll come, come to you shortly, Emma. Uh, Jonathan, some of the companies say when they pick up new customers, because of the, the price cap, they're actually going to be losing money on the new customers. Do you think that's a credible argument? And if it is a credible argument, how do they recover these costs or else you're perpetuating what, what's happening? Because that, that puts more pressure on the companies. So we, so, so part of the arrangements around the levy are focused on any costs where the price, the price that's charged is different from the, um, from, from, from what can be recovered. So that is part of the discussion around what the levy payments might be. So the, the concept behind the, the supply of last resort regime is we ask companies, you know, what is the minimum impact can, you can have on other customers to take these customers on? And that's the process that we run. Okay, Emma, you wanted then, can you come in briefly, but also can you, Advice. As, as, as a, sorry, can you also have a, few, a couple of brief comments now? But also advise: Is there an appetite among, amongst energy retailers to actually take on new, new customers through supplier of last resort? So, the, sh the short answer is: It's very challenging to take on additional customers in this market. Um, you know, some of our members are reporting costs of about six hundred pounds per customer. And that's both because they have to buy energy on, on this market at the price that gas is to supply those customers. Um, and, but in, in addition, it's obviously expensive to bring customers on, just the, the administrative process involved can be complex. And given the number of failures we may be talking about and planning for, we are worried about those administrative costs and, and the number of customers we might have to be onboarding. So in short, because the market is so tight, even well-run, well-hedged, well-managed companies with, with you know, significant balance sheets and, and all of those things are looking at this market and thinking it would be very difficult to take on extra customers, whilst also wanting to step up and do their bit. So that is the crux of the conversation with government. And, and someone asked about solutions earlier in the speculation in the press. I think it's fair to say that we have all identified the solar mechanism, the supplier of last resort mechanism, as the thing to focus on in the short term. Um, whilst not losing sight of the overall market that we need to have a look at. And the key point on the solar process right now is cash flow. It takes about 15 months to recover costs in the existing solar process, on top of all those factors I've already described. So it's very difficult for, for companies to come forward. And the proposals are all around whether we can use that cash flow to make it you know, easier given the extreme circumstances we're in. 
And you, said, you, you said £600 per customer as a loss if companies take them on as supplier of last resort. So is that not then suggestive of massive losses that other companies are making right now? They're operating and selling in lower tariffs. Yeah, there's, I mean, as I said, um, well run, well hedged companies who know what they're doing in the retail market have been struggling for a long time to um, make everything stack up. And that, and that's not to say that they don't have all the governance in place that you would want, or that they're not meeting their supplier obligations, or that they don't know what they're doing. It's just challenging because of the market design, and there are limits they can do as companies that are put upon them by the market design. So um, that that. You know, we've, we've covered that at length. In terms of the solar process, yes, we're worried about losses on top of companies already making losses on, on things like, you know, catch tariffs. And that's one of the reasons why I'm saying in the short term, we want to work with government and the, regu and the regulator to make sure we have a process in place to pick customers up. That is our number one priority right now. In the medium to long term, we do need to look at why the suppliers find it so challenging to make money and why they're loss making even when they're doing the right things. Okay, I've got one final question it's for you, Adam. Can you estimate how many people you think are at risk of fuel poverty given the increase in prices and what effect the universal uh, credit cut have and people's ability to pay their bills as well? I mean, to be honest, I, I try not to think about the, the, the increased numbers of people going into fuel poverty. So, about four million households <clears throat> me, across the, the UK, some estimates, multiple hundreds of thousands, possibly 500,000 more. I don't think anyone's done some real modelling after the price spike has come in, but it's going to be very considerable. Um, on the, the universal credit, so look, we've, we've talked primarily about the interaction between the supply market and the and the, and the regulator, what the government can do is absolutely critical. If you think about this, not just as transactional customers, but as households who need to keep themselves and their families uh, warm. Universal credit, there's a correlation between people on universal credit, about 40% of them are on prepayment meters, a higher proportion of them are in debt. Many of them are unable to take advantage of the best deals in the market. So for me, it's unconscionable that it should go, to be honest. I can't see any real rationale for it to, to happen in the, in the current, but not just because it's an extra £20, but because the correlation between recipients and their energy use and their vulnerability to energy prices is so clear. And it's the next session with the Secretary of State. The universal credit is key. We know furlough unravelling, we know the national insurance contribution, inflationary pressures on food, lots of other things. Incomes will be lower for many people, bills will be higher. In addition to that, I do think we need to look at the mechanism, the rebate mechanism, the warm home discount mechanism, uh, and how we can deepen that and extend it now over the winter, and that's a government uh, opportunity, in order that we take some of this thing, as I said before, this is damage limitation out of it. Universal credit, surely it has to stay. Surely there's a way of working around the government's commitments that we can keep it for longer. But warm home discount as well, it's critical that everyone who's eligible for it receives it. It's a bit yeah. of irony that the £140 of the price cap rise is exactly the same amount as the warm home yeah. discount. Thank, thanks very much, Pratt. I hear you loud and clear. I need to hand back the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Charlotte Nichols, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is to Mr Brearley. The special administration regime has never been tested before. So what are you doing to maximise the capacity of this process to manage a potentially high number of exits from the market? And do you have any concern about potential snags? So um, you're right, the special administration regime has never been used before, but, but right, right the way through, right at the start of the COVID crisis, when we were concerned about companies' capacity to weather through that, we have worked very, very closely with Bayes and war-gamed a whole range of scenarios. So we are confident that the regime will work, but clearly in, in, in a scale of change of that nature, there will be things that will come up and we in Bayes will deal with them. Thank you for that. The Special administration regime is expected to be used for the failure of large energy supply companies only. How would you define large in this case? Well, it all, it all comes down essentially. So, so the special administration regime was designed where the, when we get to a situation where the solar process simply isn't working. 
So it's not just designed for, for medium and large companies. That's what it was envisaged for. But if you get to a point where you can't transfer companies to somewhere else, then, then you appoint an administrator and their job is to run the company, not only in the interest of creditors, but also in the, but, but primarily in the interest of customers. So in a sense, you know, it, it's hard to put a line on it because it really depends on the capacity of the market to absorb customers. Thank you. And if you were to use special administration, how would you ensure that the administrator was competent to run the failed supplier at efficient cost and to deliver a good service to customers? So we have a set of criteria when we, when we go out to get the administrator and all of those criteria are part of that assessment. Thank you. And to Mr. Scora, is there anything you'd like to add from a consumer point of view there? I mean, the only point is the conditionality on the transfer of so many kind of households over to whether it's a supplier of last resort or administrator. Uh, the word administrator makes me uh, uh, shake a, a little bit because of the, the focus on creditors rather than on, on the households they have. So a high level of conditionality on the support for low income, vulnerable, indebted prepayment meters must be, must be absolutely front and center of any such arrangement. Yeah, and so. <laughs> Yep, uh, Mr. Brilly. Just, just to jump in on that, I mean, the, this is this is the point of the special administration regime. It, anyone who is appointed, their primary duty is towards customers, mm -hmm. and we'll, you know, we'll make sure that they look after the most vulnerable customers. Ms. Pinchbeck, I can see you want to add something before I turn back to the chair. Yeah, look, I think your point that it's never been tested is a good one, and certainly when it was designed, I don't think we had it in mind for, for example, being with multiple failures that because of the condition of the whole market, others didn't want to pick up. And that said, it's an option that Bayes and government have at their disposal. However, I'd also note that the same market conditions would apply to the special administrator as applied to the sector as a whole. It'd be very, very difficult and expensive to onboard customers at this time for anyone. So should we end up in that process at the, at the bare minimum? I, I would imagine that what we all want to see is the existing um, industry pick up customers, because that is a, they know what they're doing and it should be cheaper for the taxpayer in the long run. Um, but also, if we don't end up there, the several of my members have said to me they stand ready to help government and do what they can to ensure that things like onboarding administration are done well and to lend the expertise that we have. I just, if it's all right, can I just um, echo something Adam said about I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Emma. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm afraid we need to keep moving on. Um, okay. Nadra Ghani, please. My questions are to Mr. Braley, and um, it'd, be, it'd be wonderful if we can keep your answers brief. It's on the energy price cap. You spoke about wargaming with the business department. At the moment, the energy price cap is revised retrospectively twice per year to reflect changes in the wholesale prices. It will rise by £139 on the 1st of October. What have you wargamed with the department to tell us how that number, 139, might change again on April the 1st? Well, look, I, I think one thing we shouldn't lose sight of is the impact on customers' bills. And we've already seen a big rise. £139 is already a, a big impact on household expenses. I'm afraid, again, it is, it's far too early to tell in the cycle as to what the impact will be by the 1st of April. We have, a, we have a period of time within which we gather the data from the wholesale market, but seeing the costs that we're seeing change in the market today, it is clear that that cost, cost pressure ultimately will feed through to those bills, but, but right now we can't quantify that. Mr Braley, will it be, will, uh, there must be a, a gap um, of where you think that what might, where it might fall, so will it be below or above £139? Well, as I say, it all depends on what happens to the gas price until sort of the end of January. And, and that is something that we just simply can't predict. So right now, it's too hard to tell. But clearly, you know, we've seen huge changes in costs. So those have to have an impact on customer bills. But you're not prepared to say it'll be, it'll be less than 139? It, it's hard to make a commitment on, on the size of that, given the situation in the wholesale market. OK, and then I'm just going to move on very quickly. That the, the price cap was introduced to be temporary, um, to the point where the market can manage its own effective level of competition. Um, do you think the UK will ever reach a level of competition, so there'll be a point where the price cap can actually be removed? Well, we're seeing you know, some really positive changes in the market, and we are seeing companies that have entered and, quite frankly, have shaken up the way customers are thought about and customers are served. Um, and also, remember, we've got to get to a different kind of a market. You know, Emma and, Emma and I have both talked about a world where when we move to net zero, we want more flexible tariffs, we want different kinds of services. And in that world, of course, there'll be a question about whether a price cap is appropriate. But right now, we need to protect customers. And the one thing I want to emphasize is, quite frankly, it is a good thing the price cap is in place. 
because ultimately that is protecting customers from one of the most unprecedented price shocks that we've seen. And my finally, my question to you, Ms. Burley, again, is um, what confidence can you give us today that the uh, that Ofgem is actually functioning correctly to ensure that um, suppliers can manage their finance and that there is an appropriate review of the price gap going forward? Uh, I, I'm, I don't feel absolutely confident because you're saying everything, all the questions that we're asking requires you to speculate and you're not able to even provide a window that we can go home and give to our constituents about what future prices might be. Yeah, look, we work very closely with the suppliers in their financial situation. We are in detailed conversation with a number of companies about what happens. All I'm reflecting, I'm afraid, is the uncertainty which is outside the control of this country, not even outside the control of the regulator. Our job is to manage those, those scenarios and make sure that we can, we, can, we can cope. Now, the important thing is, is that we look after the needs of the customers through this, and that's what we are generally focused on. Thank you. Okay, uh, well that brings our first panel to an end. Thank you to Emma Pinchbeck, Jonathan Braley and Adam Scorer for your uh, answers uh, this morning. We're grateful. Uh, we're now moving on to panel two. I'd like to spot the business secretary here in the room. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Jones. Secretary of State. And on the screen, uh, Joanna Whittington, Director General for Energy and Security uh, in the uh, department. There you are. Hello, Joanna. Um, so, um, uh, Secretary of State, uh, the Prime Minister said this was a temporary issue. Uh, in panel one, we weren't really able to... Um, get an answer as to what temporary means. What does that mean to you? I think temporary means uh, that it's a, a position where the price has spiked uh, considerably. I've got a chart in front of me. I think it's quadrupled uh, in the last uh, six months, seven months. Um, and the, you would expect normally that the price would revert uh, to the mean. It's not something that we think is going to be sustainable. But of course, Mr. Jones, we have to prepare uh, for longer term uh, high prices. Okay, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, and on the floor of the House the other day when I asked about the continuation of the warm homes discount rebate following yep. consumers, other things like their debt repayment plans like we've heard when they're forced to change supplier, um, you weren't able to give a commitment because you understandably said it was a fiscal issue. Has the Chancellor um, agreed any financial envelope for you to support well, consumers yet? I'll say exactly what I said on the floor of the House, that it is a fiscal issue, but you can rest assured that I and the department and officials are very keen to sustain the Warm Homes Grant uh, simply because uh, of the, uh, the, the, the situation as Jonathan Braley described. We have to protect customers and the Warm Home uh, Discount is a clearly a very good measure to protect the most vulnerable, exposed uh, and also elderly customers. When do you think the Chancellor might give you some money? Well, as you know, there's a, we have a fiscal event called the Budget uh, at the end of October and uh, all will be revealed there. We've also got a spending review as well, so there'll be plenty of data and information about that then. Um, and in Spain, I understand the government there has put a windfall tax on the generators and traders who are making very significant profits at the moment from what's happening in the gas market uh, in order to fund some of the protections for consumers. Uh, have you considered that option? We're looking at all options. Uh, I think uh, what they're doing uh, in Spain is recognizing that it's an entire system. The energy system is an entire system. Um, but I'm in discussion with Ofgem and um, other officials looking at all options. And we've just heard in panel one that uh, the regulator Ofgem has known for some time that many suppliers in the retail market have been loss-making. We heard from the energy representative from the sector that they were concerned about fragility of the suppliers for quite some time. How did we end up in a position in a regulated market where we knew that a number of companies were loss-making or uh, in your words, not being run well, uh, mm. with hindsight, albeit at this stage, and allowed them to continue offering very low prices to customers. So the, the nature of the um, market uh, in the last few years has been that there have been quite low barriers to entry. Uh, when I became energy minister more than two years ago, there were 65 um, suppliers. The figure, I think, now is between about 50 and 55, obviously depending on the outcome of the solar process. And as I said uh, many times, uh, typically at this time of year, between five and eight uh, companies exit the market. That's something that, that we frequently see uh, and clearly there's a lot more pressure uh, this year uh, and we've anticipated the, the spike in price because we could see it in the summer and that's partly the reason why the price cap went up as uh, Ms Garney suggested uh, 139 pounds for this period. Um, so we have uh, some degree of foresight but of course we don't know the exact number of companies that may have to go through the solar process. Um, on the price cap, so the, the recent uplift in the price cap is, I think, as I understand it, is only going to hit consumer bills in a few months' time. Yeah. And that's before the current 
spike has been factored in. So when we talk about this being a temporary <coughs> issue, actually for bill payers, this is going to run on for months and months, isn't it, as the market catches up with their bills? As I look at the, the gas price chart, um, what happened, the, the gas prices have been rising all year. And so when the price cap was determined, the increase was determined uh, for this uh, 1st of October, the next period, uh, the, some of that price increase had been factored in. We were aware of what was going on, but you're quite right that it does look retrospectively. So you're setting the price for the next six month period. And we've just had a, a brief conversation on the different processes that we might follow when energy companies go out of bust. And obviously, protecting consumers has to be the number one priority. Absolutely number one. But I agree with you that a competitive market in the long term is also important. Now, if I was the CEO of a big energy company uh, looking at all of these market failures and the solar process, I'd be thinking, great, because all those customers I've lost to competitors over the last few years are just going to come back to me and the industry levy is going to help me pay for that and we're just going to end up in a situation again where a few big players have uh, most of the uh, uh, customers. Now I understand why that might be an easy option to follow because it's an existing process but do you worry that that is going to result in a very uncompetitive market and therefore are you looking at things like a bad bank or special administrative regimes to try to maintain longer term. Well, before we get ahead of ourselves and talk about um, SAR and, and bad banks, I, just, I want to make something very clear. I think competition is absolutely at the forefront of this market. I don't want to go back, and I've said this repeatedly in private and publicly, I don't want to go back to a, a, a cosy uh, oligopoly um, where a small number, a very limited number of companies can set whichever price uh, they feel appropriate. I think competition has worked in the market. I was very happy with uh, Jonathan Braley to, ho to host a small, a small supplier roundtable. Um, and clearly some of the most innovative, creative companies in the sector are smaller companies. So I, don't, I want to kill the misapprehension that somehow the small companies are bad and big companies are good. We need a range of suppliers in a competitive marketplace. Good. And um, one thing that's not often mentioned in this debate is the impact on um, jobs. So for people who work at the energy companies that have gone bust, um, or the fertiliser plants that were closed temporarily, or they, they're now going to be fired up again. Is there any support being put in place to protect people who've lost their jobs through this? Um, well, of course, we've got the, the, the general support through uh, the COVID uh, period. Uh, Jonathan Brearley talked about the various uh, interventions, I think, that we've made with Bayes uh, and uh, Ofgem uh, to support uh, people in this very difficult period. Um, but of course, as Energy Minister and now Secretary of State, my primary focus is actually on the consumer. That's, that's, those are the people that are 100% of my focus. So there's no discussions in place that says if the customers from Bust Energy Company X goes to Company Y, that Company Y might try to give first preference to the additional jobs they might need uh, from the company that's just gone bust. I think the way in which the um, larger company or the, the solvent company, whatever you want to call it, absorbs customers um, <coughs> is something that is always being uh, looked at because if you're a company that suddenly has a, ho a lots of new customers, you probably do have administrative costs. You might want to hire more people, and some of those people might well be people who are working in the old uh, the, the, the supplier uh, that's that's gone out of business. Um, but that that's a, a, a conversation that we we have all the time. Okay, Alan Brown, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, not as a whole range of factors that's affected the gas prices yeah. and as a worldwide issue, but equally. The UK could add a small buffer in terms of 2017 allowed the closure of the rough uh, storage facility, which actually accounted for 70% of the UK's gas storage. How short-sighted was that? See, I think that the issue of storage, and here I might um, bring in uh, Joanna Whittington, the official, I think it's a slight red herring because no matter what storage you have, it doesn't actually affect the global price. And what's happening here is uh, the supply chains are being squeezed by the fact that the, oil, the gas prices, I've said, has quadrupled in the last uh, six months. Did that not mean that storage was surplus to requirements all these years? I mean, why, why did so, it function? And, and, the, and another, another function of storage is that depending on who stores the gas, uh, obviously the higher the price, the more incentivized they are simply to sell the gas that they're storing uh, in, in, in the open market. So I don't think the issue of storage, frankly, is particularly relevant. But I'd like to refer to Joanna Whittington as well on this particular subject. Thank you, Secretary of State. Yes, so storage plays a different role in the UK market, where we use it just to help with sort of operational day-to-day -day balancing. What we really rely on for security of supply is a very diverse um, range of different sources of gas. So from the UK continental shelf, the Norwegian continental shelf, and then 
uh, really importantly, three LNG facilities at Isle of Grain and Milford Haven, together with interconnection between the UK and um, Belgium and the Netherlands. And so our need for storage isn't the same as those countries which don't have that same diverse supply. Okay, so any of the express concerns about the that storage were completely wrong at the time? I don't think storage is really what, what this issue is about. I know people have express concerns. About I know, I acknowledge there's wider issues, but... No, but I'm just answering your question. I, I don't think storage is... It's been made a big thing of. I don't think it really addresses the problem that we're facing. Okay, and if we look at storage in the wider sense of electricity storage or having dispatchable electricity, um, you know, where obviously there's reliance on gas for dispatchable electricity at the moment. You've been very clear on nuclear as one of the solutions going forward, but is it not the case that Hinkley is the most expensive nuclear station in the world? It won't be online, Unit 1 won't be online until June 26 at the earliest, was a reported up to 15 month delay. Five of the existing nuclear stations will be offline before Hinkley comes online. Sizeable C still doesn't have planned permission, environmental permissions can't be constructed for at least 10 years. So surely nuclear is not the solution and we should be looking at other things. You've, you've said you're in favour of pumped hydro storage. So when will there be when we look at a, a route to market for pumped hydro storage? I think that's a great question. So um, when I say that nuclear is the answer, clearly it's not the answer next week because it takes time uh, to get nuclear facilities up and running. I think as far as 2050 is concerned, all the modelling I've seen suggests quite a, 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 a large degree of, of nuclear. If I had to put a figure on it, I'd guess something like 15% of our capacity could come from nuclear. But you're right, it takes time. Uh, to get nuclear facilities up and running. And also we're looking at small modular, modular reactors, not just the large uh, nuclear plants. In terms of storage, I think you're right. I think we could do more. We're, we're, uh, as you know, and you've campaigned very uh, uh, effectively on this, we're looking at carbon capture, uh, which I think is a part of the energy mix. We're looking to develop hydrogen, which I know you've got a, a considerable interest and knowledge in. Uh, and also I think that uh, we should be looking at hydroelectric power as well. Uh, and I know that's something that you're... Uh, your particular you time scale for when negotiations and possible I can't give you a time to market this is for pump storage hydro. It, I, I will give you an undertaking that this is something which the department is is, is keen to progress uh, because I, I listened to the arguments on the hydro uh, power and storage and I think we have got a storage issue and we should look at everything we can to, to, to pursue that. All I would say about this is that you know if I speak to my Norwegian counterpart, they are a country which is ninety six percent of the electricity comes from essentially hydro um, type uh, uh, sources. The geography of, of, the, of the UK, the geology even of the UK, won't lend itself to that degree of... Uh, uh, of, of well, that's production. right, but Corrie Glass is designed, got all the permissions and ready to go in Scotland. Drax is looking at doubling the capacity at Kruken. All that's needed is the negotiations and agreement and price and a route to market. And these projects could be delivered much quicker than, say, nuclear. Can, can be delivered, so that's why I'm requesting... I think that's a good challenge. Um, I will revert to the officials to, see, to say um, what our official position is on this. But I've always said from my first days as Energy Minister more than two years ago, we have to look at a, a huge diversity of sources. There's no, and this crisis, or if people, um, you know, this, this situation uh, has suggested that we need to have a much... Uh, uh, look at a wide range of sources, which we do in the UK, as uh, Mrs. W Mrs. Whittington, Ms. Whittington suggested. Just, just one other quick question. Very, very quickly, please. Um, at the moment, if you store electricity, let's say through a battery or some other similar technology, you're actually charged when you release that storage back into the grid. So you're effectively charged twice a generator. All that's required is the electricity act 1989's changed, and the government's been pledging to do this. I've been asking about it for four years. Can you advise when you're going to change the electricity art that would then encourage development and deployment of storage? I think you're right. I think the, the system needs to be much more nimble. We've been saying this for years, but we really need to deliver on that. I completely agree with you, and that's why one of the things I did when I was Energy Minister was to look at how we can have a much more nimble system. Uh, but I'd like to um, bring in the official to, to reflect on some of the things I've said. Um, so absolutely, uh, diversity of supply isn't just a gas issue, it's a really important part of the electricity mix. Going forward, we've got a whole load of investments in renewables, 
um, floor offshore uh, and solar technologies alongside CCS um, uh, and nuclear. But as you say, there are other things that we need to support that system. So both interconnectors, demand side response and storage of electricity will provide the flexibility to give the same level of security that we have today, but with more zero or very low carbon emissions. And that's all in the context of our expectation that demand for electricity will also double in the period out of 2050 as we look to decarbonize heat and transport through their electrification. The reason that's important is it provides opportunities for some of the retail businesses and why, looping back to some of the comments made earlier, it's so important that we have a dynamic retail sector that's interested, for example, in investing in heat pumps, that's interested in developing time of use tariffs, all of which will support our endeavor to decarbonize the energy system by 2050. Thank you very much. Alexander Stafford, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary of State. You mentioned a lot of your statement about the work you've been doing with Norway, but what conversations have you had with your EU counterparts rather than EEA uh, about gas supply both now and ahead of the winter? Um, I was um, lucky enough to meet Kadri Simpson, um, who is the EU Commissioner uh, for Energy, uh, and we've discussed supply issues, uh, we've discussed security issues, we've discussed particularly decarbonisation. As far as I understand, I think there's an EU Energy Minister's Summit today uh, to discuss uh, this very question, which demonstrates that this is a global uh, issue. It's not something which uh, is simply uh, of interest and, and concern to us here in the UK. Obviously, there's an EU summit going on today. We're not part of that because now we've left the EU. Does that create frictions when dealing with the EU to sort out this problem? Does it create a discussion? I don't not get the intelligence. How is that working if they're talking? I, about I would say that in terms of energy cooperation, um, this is one area where um, we have very good relations uh, with the EU. As I've said, um, when I was energy minister, I spoke to a number of uh, EU energy ministers. Uh, I've spoken to Kadri Simpson. We've been on panels. Uh, and we have very much uh, similar uh, aspirations as far as uh, energy is concerned. I mean, you'll, you'll appreciate that globally, the EU and countries in the EU think the same way as we do about decarbonisation. And, in, and, and in, in the international forums, I find myself very much working with EU colleagues to persuade others uh, about the need to decarbonise and about the need to get to net zero. So I think the energy cooperation between ourselves here in the UK and the EU is, is, is a strong one. Do you think the room when it comes to the conversation has any impact on our prices here in the UK? So what's impacting prices in the UK is a global price. So even the EU with the best will in the world, uh, they can come together, but they can't actually affect what's going on in Asia or what the Asian demand is. And that's really uh, what's one of the big drivers uh, to the gas price. So I don't think it makes a difference one way or the other, whether we're in the EU or not. Obviously, with the EU reliant on Nord Stream 2, coming like that, has the current, present crisis changed the UK's view on Nord Stream 2? I know it's only a small part of it, but obviously Nord Stream 2 is vital for EU, and therefore that might have a knock on the UK. So has that changed our views on Nord Stream 2? It hasn't. We've um, always felt uh, that um, the energy partnership um, that the EU have with the Nord Stream uh, 2, I think, is something that we, you know, we, we, we would broadly... Um, I've always uh, supported it. But, but I need to stress one thing. We are not exposed in the same way uh, to the Russian supply, gas supply, as many of our EU counterparts. And I think that's something we need to stress. Um, a lot of our energy supply, most of it, um, is, is, is outside uh, the control of Russia, the vast proportion of it. Thank you. Uh, Nizra, did you want to come in? Oh, uh, yes, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kwarteng. I was just reading up on what the other select committee chairs have been talking about, the very issue about Russia potentially controlling the supply chain. I mean, I take on board your point that we're not as reliant as the rest of Europe, but what Russia does impact, does impact the, the cost of price. And one of the, the chairs of, her, of the, um, actually the Defence Select Committee has said that this example of Russia's behaviour is a grey zone conflict. And we did ask earlier on at the panel what work was being done to ensure that we're forecasting or being resilient to what happens or what actions Russia might take. I think the way to um, be resilient generally, regardless of what Russia does, is to have a diversity of supply, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we can accelerate uh, things like carbon capture, uh, to make sure that we can really drive uh, hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen economy, which I know that Mr Stafford is very uh, keenly engaged with, 
uh, and to, to pursue uh, uh, the strategy that we're, we're doing with regard to renewables. That's the, the diversity of supply will protect us against uh, any shocks uh, to the system, uh, which may deliberately be orchestrated by uh, Putin's, Mr. Putin's regime. How do you respond to, Minister, the, the term grey zone conflict? I wouldn't use that phrase. I think the word conflict is a highly loaded one. Um, and I would just focus on what we can do to ensure that we have security of supply. Um, and, you know, obviously the consumer is a, is a key priority. Security of supply is another key priority. And then I would suggest that decarbonisation and the green agenda is the third um, metric which we should judge our energy policy by. Um, Secretary of State, your role was removed from the standing membership of the National Security Council before the summer recess. Surely, because these issues are related, you should be back on that, no? That's a question for the, uh, <laughs> the Cabinet Office. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that uh, in many uh, cases, one tries to streamline committees, one tries to limit the membership to people who are directly uh, exposed to, to, to those issues, and, and that was a decision that was taken. Okay, thank you. Richard Fuller. Secretary of State, thank yeah. you, uh, Chair. Seriously, uh, yesterday you said it's not, quote, the right thing for taxpayers' money to be injected into companies that have been badly run. Were there certain characteristics in this particular context of being badly run that you had in mind? I'm not, I'm not going to name names or finger the blame. All I'm saying is that if you look at the energy supply market, you've got lots and lots of players coming in and out of the market, as I've said repeatedly. Typically at this time of year, you'd see between five and eight companies exit the market. And some of those companies exiting the market have only been in the market for maybe a year or a year and a half sometimes. Uh, so what I don't want to do is to put taxpayers' money to companies which have come into the market only to exit it after a year. I don't think that's responsible. We, we can trust you to be vigilant in the protection of taxpayers' Absolutely taxpayer vigilant. I've said that. But I also have said, and I've spoken to a lot of small suppliers, I don't want this committee or anyone else to think that uh, small suppliers equal badly run and large suppliers equal uh, well run. There's a whole mix of, you know, large companies can be badly run, small companies can be brilliantly run. And actually, as it happens in this market, a lot of the innovation, a lot of the dynamism has been provided by uh, smaller suppliers. In the earlier panel, we talked a little bit about the role of hedging and the policies of hedging, yeah. not the hedging markets, between companies and perhaps some consideration that there should be greater requirements for hedging on companies, but that would have an effect potentially on competition. Do you have any thoughts about that? I think that's a really uh, fair point, because clearly if you're going to have large hedging requirements, that requires upfront uh, capital, it requ requires collateral. And of course, if you're a smaller business, your ability to do that is, is more limited. Um, but I think that in any responsible business, you have to have some risk mitigation uh, element. And clearly, in this market, hedging is, is, is a key part of that. There's been much speculation in the press about potential ways the government could intervene if it wished to. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to put you on the spot now to ask you, have Why you not? made a decision? That's what I'm here for. <laughs> May I put you on the spot, Secretary saying, have you decided <laughs> which of the approaches would be your preference? So we're talking about, I mean, one of the, so the couple of principles, a number of principles that we've established. The first is that the consumer experience has to be as smooth as possible. And second, consumers have to be protected from exorbitant prices. We have, and, and within that, we have to uh, protect uh, vulnerable uh, consumers. That's, those are the top priorities. In terms of um, ongoing uh, support, the other thing I want to stress is that the, the industry needs to look to itself for solutions in the first instance. What government does is in extreme situations, uh, it can look at um, measures uh, to, to deal with those extreme situations. But in the first instance, the industry has to look to itself. And as you said at the beginning of your question, I am, you know where I, I stand in these issues. I do not believe that it is responsible government to put taxpayers' money uh, to, to companies that have been run. So that means that I don't think we should be rewarding failure. I don't think you quite told us which of the options you were preferring. Well, I'm not going well, so, to. Well, I, you haven't told me what the options are. I mean, I don't know what you know. There's a, well, I, 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 only what I read really in the press, the press, <laughs> I the press secretary. But the, there are options of a, of a bad bank approach or about subsidising the transfer of customers through a temporary period or having Ofgem take on a more significant role. So I think, and I need to stress this, I think the solar process and the SAR process, which hasn't been tested yet, I think that they are robust. Uh, as Jonathan Brearley said throughout the COVID uh, process, all through COVID, I was the energy minister and I was in regular contact with Jonathan up to two or three times a week discussing this very situation because 
um, at the time, we felt that there would be a real uh, challenge to energy companies, which, you know, um, thank God, didn't happen. The, 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 the um, system, the companies were more robust than perhaps many of us anticipated in March last year. Um, and, I th and I think that the solar process and the SAR process are robust. I want them to be tested. I want them, I, I don't think we need to uh, go beyond them, so uh, uh, as far as I can see. But uh, we're clearly also planning for, for other contingencies, and that's what responsible government does. Final question from me, Secretary of State. Um, and it goes to this issue of the responsibility of the boards and investors of companies at the moment. They're going through difficult times. And in the earlier panel, the a representative of the industry uh, made a comment that some companies, for some companies, there's no no cash down the back of a of the sofa. And you've just said that you feel it's important for companies to step up themselves first before taxpayers. What's the message you would send to the directors of those companies at this stage about where they should be looking first to get? I think they should look to their own resources and look at their own business models and their own management, because it cannot be right for companies that have entered the market recently. Uh, and then now, uh, essentially in difficult times, uh, stretching out a hand for, for, for taxpayers' money. I don't think that's uh, right. Um, and, and, and I would ask the, uh, and I am asking the industry to look to itself uh, to, to, to um, support itself. I think it can do that. I think there's some very good companies out there. Uh, and also I feel that the structures that we have now are robust. So you will have seen reports that the, some of the industry players are saying we should remove the price cap. I'm absolute, I've absolutely rebuffed that. I said the price cap is, is, is here to stay, we're not moving it, and they have to work within that context. And, what, and Mr. Fuller, what really surprises me is that I know companies who went into the market when they knew there was a price cap, and now they're complaining about the price cap. Okay. So it's a very odd uh, situation uh, if you're starting a business to, 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 to go in with your eyes open and then complain about a key feature which was there when you entered the, the market. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Jenkinson, please. Thanks, Chair. Secretary of State, we, we've just talked a bit about the solar process, or so touched on it a number of times. It's been reported by industry sources that we might be down to 10 suppliers by, uh, by this year. And of course, the costs of the solar process are borne by all um, u utility users as they're socialised as a, as a uh, levy on, on energy bills. If that scenario does play out and we end up down to 10 suppliers, have you got an assessment of the cost? Uh, the overall cost and the cost to the consumer through that. So I, I've been asked this repeatedly in in in, in uh, the media, in the morning round, radio, about this ten supplier figure. I don't know where that came from. Um, I think it was uh, uh, maybe Beringer Associates, uh, an energy research firm, um, and I don't see where how they got to that figure. I'd be very surprised, frankly, um, if we got to that figure. I think it's. Uh, I mean, I'm not here to comment on on numbers, but I want to see a competitive market. Um, and clearly a, a wholesale collapse or exiting of the market of, uh, of that nature w would severely, I think, reduce competition. And that's not what I'm anticipating. It's not what I see. Is there a, a potential to allow the costs to be recouped? Uh, so whatever number we see exit, and we, we recognise that you know, every year there are a number of suppliers exit the market, is there a, is there a potential for allowing... Um, the cost of that to be spread over a longer period for consumers, or is the, is the department doing any work on, on things like that? So generally, in the solar process, what happens is that the cost of absorbing the customers goes uh, in the first place falls on the on the company that's absorbing the customers, and it, and then the cost is what we call mutualised across uh, the sector. So that's the solar process, and as I've said, um, so far the solar process has proved to be pretty robust. So that's what's uh, in the first instance is w what we're going to continue to do. Have you got any assessment of um, how viable the, the financial health of viability of the remaining suppliers, um, you know, the risk of a domino effect should we, should we uh, end up in solar process for a number of suppliers this year? There's always, a, in any market, uh, there's always a risk of, of what they call contagion. So, and, and typically, one can see that in you know, the banking crisis, for example, in 2008. I think that risk is very low, um, but there's all, in all markets, there's a, there's a risk of that. Uh, and obviously, you know, that's one of the reasons why I speak to Ofgem, to try and prepare us uh, for an extreme situation like that. But I don't, I don't see that happening uh, this year. There is a willingness 
among the remaining suppliers to play their part in the solar process? Is there that, that's an ongoing discussion that you're having? I think, I think there is, because I mean, if you just look at the structure of the market, you have a market where there are, let's say, 50 suppliers, maybe more, um, and uh, there's a sense in which um, you know, if, if you can ex expand market share uh, and you're a, a well-run, um, you know, very solvent company, liquid uh, company, um, you, you, you would take advantage uh, in many instances of, of expanding your market share. That's a normal market mechanism. You talked about vulnerable customers being a priority. Um, are we confident that we are protecting the warm home discount uh, in the event of solar process? Um, that existing repayment plans are honoured uh, and that new suppliers are flexible with repayment plans for those customers that have debts um, and that those on prepayment meters have their credit balances protected and, and transferred quickly. We're very focused on this. I mean, in fact, in one of the round tables that I hosted only a couple of days ago, this very issue of prepayment customers was raised and there was almost universal agreement among the people uh, in the panel on the round table that uh, we, should, we should be protecting uh, those, those customers. Because as I think Mr. Scora said in the earlier panel, there is a high level of correlation between people who are on prepayment uh, um, um, meters uh, uh, and also people who um, receive universal credit. And that's something I'm very conscious of. And that's why I want to protect them uh, in, this, in this energy squeeze. And similarly for small business customers, for example, with credit balances, we're, uh, we're confident that we can quickly transfer some of those. Yes, I think I think um, the similar protection. Obviously, they don't have a, a price cap in the way that consu retail consumers do, but there are lots of uh, ways in which we're trying to, to soften the impact on high, of high energy prices, uh, not only on small businesses but in, across the economy generally, particularly in industry uh, and uh, and other businesses. Executive Officer, okay. thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm conscious that things are moving quickly, but on some of those questions around the warm homes discount, I know we need to wait to see on that, but on debt repayment plans, on uh, the meter key credit status, uh, none of it feels very firmed up yet. Yes. And if you know our constituents are watching this discussion today and they're worried, they're going to want to know actually what it is that's going to be put in place to protect those uh, support measures uh, when they have to change energy supplier. When are we going to be able to give them that? Um, look, I think, as you say, it's a fast-moving uh, situation. In many ways, I feel we're running ahead of, uh, of, of ourselves because from what we have now, the solar process is working. Uh, the SAR process, which we have in place, hasn't even uh, been needed to be used. Uh, and there is a danger, uh, Mr. Jones, that we essentially are talking ourselves into the panic. It's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, and I don't want that uh, to happen. I think we are managing the process. But... You know, in, in extremis, I think that uh, uh, people will be protected, even though, uh, for now, I can't give chapter and verse details. I mean, I'll turn to Joanna Whittington uh, to see if, uh, uh, if she has any further comments on this in terms of our, our key focus on protecting the vulnerable. Um, so it's already the case that credit balances of domestic consumers are protected uh, through the solar process. Um, for small businesses, uh, they tend to manage their credit balances more tightly anyway, um, uh, but they tend to also to be honoured through the solar processes that we've seen to date. Um, I think it is a question for Ofgem and their regulation of the supply businesses around how they um, maintain the, the same level of um, protection for vulnerable consumers. And I know that they've made a number of changes to the way the supplier license works uh, to protect against poor customer service and financial instability. And those new requirements came into place in uh, 2019. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, we've heard today about war gaming and scenario planning from the regulator and industry. I, I'd just suggest that it would be good to have a bit more confidence around the war gaming about how we protect consumers as well as how we protect supply and how we administer failed, failed companies. But, um, I'll just... well, but Mr. Jones, we've set out very clearly the solar process. We've said that that's been working over the last few years. We've set out the SAR regime. We've pointed Consumer out consumer protections. That's the okay. And the, but you did mention the the the, the protecting the, the suppliers. And Miss um, Whittington suggested that the um, consumer balances are protected as well now. 
So uh, I'm sorry we haven't given you as much detail as you would like, but there are lots of things that we are doing now and structures here now that do protect uh, consumers in the way we all want to see. What, what would be useful, uh, if we could, is have a list of uh, what protections are currently uh, uh, protected when a customer changes energy supplier and which ones are not currently protected, and whether that is a decision for the energy company, the regulator, or your department to kind of confirm, because it just is st it's still not giving the confidence that you know, okay. people will want. Thank you. Um, Mark Pawsey, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Secretary of State, I wonder if I, we might just go back a stage. Um, we know that stability of price and continuity of supply are, of gas are essential to both consumers and businesses across the UK. It's a, a key part of the work of your department. You have a very big department with many thousands of civil servants horizon scanning, checking all of these things. Why didn't we see this coming? As I said, uh, Mr. Palsy, in, in a way we did. So there was, a, there was a conversation about the energy price cap earlier, and there was a reason why it was set higher uh, for October the 1st um, uh, than, than it Did was before. Do you expect before. us to be in the situation we are in now? I, I didn't predict that gas prices would, would quadruple four times in five months. I didn't predict that. But we have got structures in place which deal with extreme situations. <laughs> now, those structures are going to be tested, um, and that's why we're here. That's why we're talking about uh, possible contingency plans. That's why Mr. Fuller's reading about these in the newspapers. But I don't. I reject the idea that somehow this was completely unexpected and we're completely unprepared. Okay. Um, but what work does your department do to anticipate events such as this? We're, you know, we're, we're investigating this enormous price hike, concern about supply, supply failing. What, what, why, why didn't we know about it earlier? Why weren't we able to take earlier action? There were, <laughs> As I've said, there were, there were elements of it that we did know about. The, you know, the, the failure of energy supply, a, an energy supplier company can be dealt with with the supply of last resort uh, uh, process. So we've set that up, and that's what is being used at the moment. The, the special administrative regime that we've talked about is set up precisely uh, in the event, which hasn't happened yet. Yes, sir. Of, uh, so, so, so it's not fair to say that this was somehow something that just happened and we were completely, uh, we, we were completely at sea. There were other elements. I think with the, particularly with the CO2 uh, situation, uh, which uh, were, were more novel. But again, we, 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 we solved that particular problem uh, and we're dealing with it in, in real time. So uh, there were some elements, I agree, that um, we, we, we have been more surprised about, maybe. But, the, the, but the, there is a regime, uh, there are structures to deal with distress in this market and they're being tested now. Yeah, we heard in the earlier session about the exceptional nature of the circumstances that have arisen, um, that, that they're unprecedented, but the special administration regime has never been used. Yes. How confident are you that it'll, it'll work not having previously been tested? As Jonathan Brearley said, um, we, we stress test a lot of this in the COVID period. You know, you'll remember that we, for, for a whole year, uh, we were effectively in a series of lockdowns, more than that. Um, and there was real stress in the energy market. I was the energy minister. We had weekly calls. I used to speak to Jonathan all the time, and we talked about these very issues. And the fact that the SAR hasn't been tested is a good thing, because it means that a large supplier hasn't, hasn't, hasn't uh, uh, exited the market. Um, time will tell whether we need to use that regime. Um, but it's, it's, like, it's like complaining about... Um, you know, lifeboats and saying, oh, they've never been used. Well, that's a good thing if they're not used because well, it means you, you, you've not been in danger. The measures that exist with I think are, I'm conf are, will do their job. As Jonathan Brearley said, I think the SAR regime is robust. Only, only actual real experience will test that. But as far as I can see, I think it's, it's a robust a regime. And as I've said, we've got structures in place to deal with the very extreme scenarios, which thankfully haven't happened yet, uh, but to deal with those extreme uh, scenarios should they arise. Do you think there's a likelihood of them arising? <laughs> um, personally, I think we will be able to withstand this. But my job isn't to be a, a soothsayer or crystal ball gazer. My job is simply to prepare uh, for, the, for, for all eventualities, and that's what we're doing. Thank you, Secretary of State. Thank you, Chair. Why don't you like the bad bank option? I think that well, uh, we, can, we can talk about nomenclature. But I think that, the, as people have said repeatedly, we've got the SAR, we've got the Special Administrative Regime. That hasn't been tested. Can that be used, though, if there are multiple companies that have gone bust and are poured together? As Jonathan, I think, or Emma said, Emma Pinchbeck said in the earlier panel, it can be used in a situation. I think it was Jonathan who said that. He said it wasn't just about one particular company. It can be used 
in, in a sort of more than one, um, if you want more than one supplier fails. But, but to say that, oh, well, you don't know how it's going to work because it hasn't been tested, that's a good thing that it hasn't been tested. It's a good thing that we haven't been in a situation where we needed to fall back on it. Um, but it's there. Uh, should, should that need arise? Okay. My understanding at the moment is that um, a supplier isn't allowed to have more than 25% of the market for competition reasons. If through the solar process a particular supplier goes above 25%, are you going to give them an exclusion from the competition? That's role? a very good uh, question. I, do, I mean, looking at the... Uh, uh, yeah, I will answer it. Um, so, and I'll answer it this way. In, in an extreme case, so the, the, the lowest figure we've heard is that there will be 10 companies. I don't think that's anything uh, near the truth. But, but in, a, in a scenario where you have 10 companies, it's difficult to see one having 25%. It could happen, but I would definitely uh, uh, cross that bridge uh, when I come to it. And also, um, the competition rules are the competition rules. So I think it would be very difficult for a government simply to just abrogate those. Very good. Thank you. Judith Cummings, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Secretary of State, we've seen emerging threats through this energy crisis, and we've seen the importance to the UK economy of just two fertiliser plants. Um, we've seen threats to the security of our food supply with threatened empty shelves, and we've seen the possible impact on the NHS. Were you aware of these threats to our economy, and what contingency plans did you have in place? So we, we were aware of um, supply chain shocks. I think with regard to the CO2 situation, it was abundant, it was very uh, cheap. And a lot of people, uh, I think, were probably surprised at, at what happened. But all I would say about that is that we very rapidly dealt with that situation. Um, I met with the CEO of the relevant company twice, on Sunday uh, and on Monday, once each. Um, and we've come up with a solution, which I have to stress is, a sh is uh, very much something that is short-term support. There's no question of us. Uh, you know, uh, essentially writing a, a check for this uh, to this company indefinitely, um, and I think the CO2 issue was something which people were surprised at, but we, we're dealing with that uh, critically at the moment. Uh, to continue the theme of security um, and um, building from your answer earlier, I, I, your earlier comments seem to imply that we don't need storage in this country because we so we import so much of our gas from abroad. Um, were you aware of a complete lack of storage in the UK? I'm, I'm looking at the figures from The Guardian where the UK has 8 terawatts of hours of gas in storage, Italy has 165.8 terawatts of gas in storage, and Germany has 146.5 yeah, so terawatts. In, I'm not finished, sorry. Um, does this impact on our national security in terms of energy? As uh, Miss Whittington suggested, the reason why we're less reliant on storage is that we have a, a wider source of energy supply. So storage in this instance refers to natural gas. Um, we are less dependent on natural gas than many of those other countries that you've uh, mentioned, simply because we have a uh, greater uh, range of, of electricity supply, for example, in renewables. And what we're trying to do, the way to actually get uh, more security and more resilience is to diversify the source of electricity. My other point about storage was that storage is all very well but it doesn't actually affect the global price. So the reason why a company like CFF was in trouble was because the, the, the price of the natural gas was 900 tonnes, and the, 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 the uh, 900, 900 pounds a tonne, and, the, and the, the price of the, of the product was a lot less than that, the ammonia and the carbon dioxide. Storage isn't going to help you in that situation, because all that will happen is that the people storing it will sell it at the market price, uh, which, will be, which will be higher, uh, and, of course, the longer the market price stays high, the, the, le the less that the storage uh, can, can, can mitigate that. So I, I think it's a legitimate debate to have, but I don't think it's actually that relevant to the issue of resilience. I did hear your, your previous comments about you said that it wasn't particularly relevant, but Secretary of State, people out there will be thinking about um, protecting our national energy supply and also thinking that diversifying your supply to depend on, on countries from abroad is not particularly appealing in this time. You know, we, we worry about our own national security. But I, I, I now want to move on to, um, to the last week where um, I understand that government's been making frantic calls to energy companies um, in order for them to take on customers of now defunct energy companies under the supplier of last resort process. Would this suggest that the government 
lacks the process for dealing in this in a timely and managed fashion. Um, I mean, I'm trying to get to why the frantic calls, really, Secretary State. Well, frantic is, call. is it planned, or is this a failure of, of, of government, or is it a failure of market, or is it a failure of both? So, what you call frantic calls are, to me, absolutely necessary. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I spoke to 12 suppliers in a row on Saturday from my house. Um, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I've spoken uh, to Jonathan Braley, the uh, chief executive of Ofshem, um, more than probably three or four times in the last two or days. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm relentlessly trying to engage with the industry. These aren't frantic calls. These are, these, are, these are calls to gather information so that we can actually proceed. I've said repeatedly in the course of this session that we have structures already in place, the supply of last resort uh, process and also the special administrative regime, which somehow is, is people say, oh, well, it's not been tested yet, which is a good thing that it hasn't been tested yet. We've already got these structures in place. And on natural gas, I just want to stress, we're not relying on imports. In 2020, 50% of the natural gas uh, that we used was from the UK continental shelf, was from the UK. 30% of it was from Norway, and they've, I spoke to the Norwegian Energy Minister on Monday, and they're going to increase production as of next week, or the 1st of October. And then 18% is LNG, and 2% roughly is, is from the interconnector. So it, it's a misapprehension to say that uh, we're just simply importing all of this stuff. Uh, from uh, from abroad, 50%, as I said last year, was from the UK uh, continental shelf. Thank you. Thank you, Alan Brown. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, Secretary, you, you yourself have said that the gas crisis shows that the UK is still too reliant on fossil fuels. Now we touched on some technologies earlier on, but what's your plans to increase investment in non-fossil fuel technologies, and, you know, in order to support renewables? And how are you looking at how that's going to affect? bills going forward as well, because at the moment roughly a quarter of an electricity bill is made up of levies, so how is that going to be managed while managing this investment in renewable energy? In terms of the um, energy mix, generation mix, um, I need only point you to the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, which came out in November last year. The first was about renewable uh, wind, where I know Scotland has a great uh, stake in, in terms of offshore wind. The second uh, was about trying to develop uh, the hydrogen market. We've mentioned nuclear, uh, which is the third. One of the points is in terms of carbon capture, and I know in ACORN, you know, you are a great champion of, of, of ACORN as a potential site. Well, for carbon go ahead in the first two clusters. Well, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's oh. Yeah. Well, no, 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 I'm not saying it. Sorry, I didn't hear, well, I didn't hear your question. That's what I, I didn't heard, hear your yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear. I thought you said a court is a good thing, and I said yes. I didn't realise what exactly you were asking. Um, but, 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 these, the, but this, this range of, um, uh, of supply, I think, is a really good thing, and that's one of the things where we can get security from. What about uh, wave and tidal? Is sufficient plans in place that should allow these to get to market and to scale up? I know they're allowed to bid technically in the next uh, contracts for difference auction, but there's not enough protections to actually allow them to be successful, it would seem, to come in at small scale and then scale up. So how are you going to address that? Um, look, I, I, I think that... Um, I'd like to say something about... I made some earlier comments about Nord Stream. I mean, our position is... Uh, that we're not uh, enthusiastic about it, we don't support uh, Nord Stream 2, I needed to clarify that. Um, but we're looking to work with uh, Germany and also other partners to try and mitigate or deflect uh, Russian aggression. I wanted to be very um, clear about that. Um, look, I think in terms of the, the uh, and I'm, I'm going to answer, answer your question very broadly, I, I think the issues of supply, security of supply are really, really important. But I think, and I know you support this, moving away from fossil fuels is actually a real strength uh, for the UK and for people in Scotland as well and across the UK because I think that not only does it give a huge opportunity in terms of employment but it also gives us more security because we're not as reliant on fossil fuels and natural gas ultimately as you know is a fossil fuel um, and, and we're in agreement about that so we shouldn't I, I think we should try and celebrate that and convince uh, a, a wider section of um, you know, political opinion, that this is really important, the, the decarbonisation agenda. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you, hence I'm asking about Wave and Tidal, and I asked earlier on about public yeah. the stories, I'm, I'm all in favour of renewable, great, greater onshore, offshore wind. Yeah. Wait. Touch on as we move towards that renewable energy mix. I hear you. 
So is it right Scotland's got the highest grid charges in Europe, or surely the grid charging regime needs to be the transmission best to facilitate the deployment of renewables? The, the transmission charges that uh, Scottish cable um, transmission uh, tr uh, Scottish generators pay is something that is we're freak we're, I'm in constant conversation with not only with uh, Scottish offshore wind operators but also uh, with Ofgem. Specifically about tidal, we've got an auction round for. Um, We'll have to wait and see in the ESA uh, where we are with that. That's a part of an ongoing conversation. Is this one more? I've got a queue, I'm afraid, so sorry. I've got uh, okay. Yeah, but first, and then Alex. Just on the diversity of supply, um, and I welcome all of our announcements on renewables, but Scotland has some of the lowest grid carbon intensity, or the l gr lowest grid carbon intensity in the country. Uh, down into single fi single digit figures most days. But North Scotland can switch from 90% uh, wind to 90% nuclear at the yeah. drop of a hat. Yeah. Because when the wind stops blowing... They can, they can fly absolutely right. 50% uh, of our peak... He doesn't like nuclear, by the no, way. No, no. <laughs> That's why I make that point. <laughs> it's a hint of drop. 50% <laughs> of our peak load is base load. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I would like to see that 15% nuclear yeah, very look, much increased. But has, I suppose the question is, has this crisis focused minds a bit more on energy resilience and Absolutely. where we're heading with, with net zero and renewables? I think you're absolutely right about um, the focus on energy resilience. I'm also um, increasingly of the view that you know, this, this issue of baseload, decarbonised baseload, um, is critical. And if the question is, how can we get de decarbonised baseload without nuclear power, I don't know what the answer to that question is. I think nuclear is an essential part of a decarbonised energy system. Uh, and that's why, within government, um, for the last two and a half years, I've been very supportive of it. And not just large-scale nuclear, but small modular reactors as well. I think we need to be able to, to do both. Okay. Okay. Alex Stafford, please. I just want to quickly pick up on just what you said, Secretary State, about Nord Stream 2. Obviously, I asked yeah, 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 you did. Yeah, just yeah, to yeah. clarify, so if we're all clear, I think my question was with obviously the current crisis situation, has that changed the government's approach? No, it hasn't. It hasn't. I mean, I just wanted to be clear about that. I mean, I, I thought you were. Um, because it, clearly, it's an issue between the people who are affected by it. And that was the point I was trying to make. But our position uh, of skepticism hasn't changed. Thank you. And you mentioned earlier the um, support that's been put in place for CF Industries to um, uh, get production going again. I think that's just for three weeks. What is it that you think is going to change in four weeks' time? Very good question. I think, you know, in a critical intervention like that, you, you have to have a way of exiting uh, the, uh, the arrangement. You know, it's not a case of just trying to nationalise it or supporting it indefinitely. And that's why I think in the, in the critical period, we needed to have a very short-term arrangement. I'm confident that we can, source, uh, we can get other sources of CO2 in that period. There was an immediate crisis, and the deal that we reached solved an immediate problem. Okay. And in the first panel, there was a lot of discussion about uh, this period of time highlighting the need for broader reform of the energy retail market. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? I think the energy retail market has evolved you know, incredibly over the last 10 years. As I've said, I think small companies have driven a lot of that innovation, so I want to see competition. But I think you know, there are issues about um, you know, how easy it is to enter the market. Um, is it sustainable to have, even in normal years, five to eight companies exit the market and essentially absorb administrative capacity in the solar process? Those are legitimate questions that we need to answer. But of course, for the moment, I'm, I'm absorbed in dealing with this present situation, and that's what I and the, the regulator and other companies uh, uh, having round tables and, and talking, seeing how we can address the immediate problem. No decision one way or the other yet, but maybe we'll... Yeah, I think, you know, we'll have other sessions, I'm sure, where we can talk about, you know, the future of the, the, the retail, the energy retail market. And we've talked a lot today about power generation from gas, but of course it's used predominantly in heating. Yeah. Um, any light of day on heat and building strategy? You were going to ask me that. I was amazed that you hadn't asked me that already. Um, and I'm going to give you the, the, the answer. I think, it, I mean, it, it's got to come out soon, right? I mean, yes. I've been saying that for six months. I'm very keen uh, to see it published. I've read uh, many drafts of it, and I want to get the, the, the debate moving forward, and I think publication would help that. It would. Uh, what's holding it up? Well, we, you know, these are delicate issues within government. Um, we're having conversations about the exact uh, best approach uh, to decarbonising uh, uh, buildings. I think it's a much more challenging 
uh, uh, problem than, than decarbonizing power generation. Um, but I'm confident that this, this, I'm finally confident that it'll, it'll come out soon. Very good. Um, I've got supplementary to Nusra and then Alexander. Well, I have a question on COP, if that's okay, okay. Chairman. Is that okay? Um, Secretary Steve, you, you've talked about all the work that you're doing day in, day out, to deal with what is, in effect, a global issue and how you respond it to it here. Um, and basically, the, it's subsidising CO2 production. It's talking about restarting colony and increasing gas supply. And if we're talking about global issues, we have COP here in a few weeks' time. How are we in other countries who are taking these steps going to be able to justify our stand when we're meant to be promoting the reduction of CO2, stopping coal mm. and reducing gas consumption. There seems to be a huge contradiction about to take place at coal. So, so I think, and that's what I've tried to stress in this session, and I've repeated this and my officials as well, uh, Mr Whittington has backed me up on this, the future to, or the key, the answer to resilience is diversifying our energy su supply away from fossil fuels. So when, when you say, oh, well, we, we need more gas, I've never said we need more gas. I said we need security of supply, and also we need to develop other technologies. And I've talked about nuclear, I've talked about renewables, uh, I've talked about better storage, uh, we've talked about hydropower, all sorts of things. That's the actual answer. And so when it comes to COP26, we will say we want to, we want to decarbonize. And one of the ways we've done this very effectively, we haven't mentioned once, we haven't mentioned coal once in this whole session. Now, 10 years ago, we would have been talking a lot about coal. I was in the parliament where 40% of our electricity generation came from coal-powered um, um, stations, and Richard Fuller was here as well in those days, um, <laughs> in those dim and distant days. Very but, old. But, <laughs> but the point I'm making is that we've made a huge uh, transition, a successful transition, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to push uh, across the world. And COP26, uh, we've got a thing called the Powering Past Coal Alliance, which is successful. More and more people want to join that. And I think we do have a message. The last thing I'd say about COP26, I think there are good noises about climate finance. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting to read what uh, President Biden was saying this week about an increased US commitment to uh, a you know, climate fund, uh, which we agreed to in Paris, if, as you remember, um, to help developing countries make that energy transition. Absolutely no contradiction between our position today and what we'll be promoting at COP. Well, I've tried to say that, you know, in, in my session, in my evidence here, I've, I've tried to say that the answer is through better provision across wider sources of energy. It's not simply just increasing gas supply, which I don't think uh, is, uh, makes sense. And one of the things we've also mentioned is carbon capture. So if you're using facilities uh, to, to, to capture carbon, it doesn't make sense to use those facilities to store natural gas, because the whole point is you're breaking down the natural gas and storing uh, the carbon dioxide. So, you know, the, 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 that, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to look forward uh, to greater use of renewables and new sources of power. Thank you, Secretary State. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And very lastly, Alexander Stafford. Just once again to go back to point, some organisations have made a lot of money out of the current gas cri crisis. Mm. At the same time, consumers' bills are increasing and will increase. Has the government considered or has the government ruled out a windfall tax to try I don't and hate, help taxpayers? I'm not a fan of windfall taxes, OK? Let me just get that straight. But of course, it's an entire system, and we have to think about how we can get the energy system as a whole to help itself. Thank you. Um, I'm sure this is the start of uh, many conversations over the coming months, and I'm grateful to you and your team. Well, I'm very uh, hopeful also. Um, just thank you very much. It was a really interesting conversation. We also have an energy minister as well, um, who's new in post, and I'm hopeful that uh, you can uh, be introduced to him. And he'll be very much look, looking forward, I'm sure he won't thank me for this, but he'll very much look forward, I'm sure, in due course to answer some of your questions, if I, for whatever reason, am unavailable. We look forward to welcoming Minister Hands to the committee. So thank you, Secretary of State. Thank you, Joanna Whittington. I'll bring the session now to an end. Order, order. Thank you. Oh, I've made Good. my questions in there. You did. It was, it was like, it was like that. Committee Room 15, Sound. Committee Room 15, Sound.